Well, howdy there, folks. Welcome into today's video. I hope you had a phenomenal holiday weekend out there. In this video here today, we're going to get into some new stocks that I'm looking at buying in 2024. And we're going to talk about why I like these stocks, why I think these stocks can prosper huge in the future, uh, why I think these could be money makers, what's the risk profile with these sorts of stocks, and, and all those sorts of things. I'm going to speak a little quieter in this video. Woke up this morning, my voice was kind of, uh, I felt like a little off. And, you know, when you spend a lot of time holiday season, you're shaking a lot of people's hands, hugging a lot of people, things like that. Uh, yeah, man, stuff gets passed around. So uh, I might talk a little quieter for today's video, but I appreciate you all joining me. As always, thanks so much for being here, folks. And uh, shout out to everybody that uh, enjoyed the uh, long weekend here. It was a nice one. And by the way, let me know what stocks you're planning on buying in 2024. I'd love to read through the comments section. I, I'm definitely going to look at the comments section of this video and really see what stocks you guys are talking about buying in 2024 because I would love to hear from you guys. And if you don't know what stocks you're buying in 2024, you might want to get a little work on in regards to that. And by the way, I put together a... Uh, very in-depth, looks like about 1,400 people got to take advantage of this so far. It's a completely free, um, like 45 minute video. I recorded, it's pinned comment down there if you want access to it. And uh, I can email it over tonight or tomorrow or in the next few days and whatnot. But um, essentially this video goes on into very in-depth how I plan to invest in 2024 with everything that's going on and the Fed talk and recession talk and no recession talk and soft landing, hard landing, all those sorts of things. So if you haven't gotten to take advantage of that, uh, which is probably most people watching this video since only 1,000 400 people have got to see that yet check out the pin comment down there and uh, take advantage of that okay so we're talking new stocks i'm buying for 2024 now first off uh let me just say 2023 has been a way better year than i expected i you know i wish i could say oh i, I knew you know the public account would be at you know 1.9 million dollars or roughly at the end of 2023 or something like that but i didn't know it was going to be this good a year it was uh definitely one of those years that blew your expectations out of the water it was uh one of those very rare years that you know, certain times in the market, things are just going to go far worse than you thought or far better than you thought. In 2022, I, I felt like, you know, especially for me or maybe a lot of market participants, it just went uh, way worse than we ever thought it could. It was like, my gosh, this thing going on, this thing. It was like thing after thing after thing, right? And then 2023 has just been pretty much an opposite year where it just seemed like everything that could have gone right has pretty much gone right for us overall, right? Now, the thing you understand about the returns you get the following year, usually a lot of it comes down to the decisions and the buys you made the, the prior year, right? So if I think about the public count, you know, started at, what, 2018 or so, the public count, and, uh, you know, in terms of the gains that came in the public count in 2019, it was because of the buys that were made in 2018, right? If I think about the results in 2020, it was because of the 2019 buys, right? If I think about, you know, 2021 was my, my best year ever in terms of taking profits in the market, if I recall. And, um, you know, that was a tremendous year, but I made a lot of, in my opinion, bad investment decisions in 2021 that led to a really bad 2022 when you tack on bad investment decisions, getting away from kind of what made me successful. And on top of that, a really bad year in general, it's a disaster, right? And then 2023 is because 2022, I got slapped in the face hard. I said, I got to get back to my blueprint, got back to my blueprint. You add on getting back to the blueprint with a good year on top of that and look at the returns this year versus S&P 500 versus bonds. I mean, it's just, we have trounced. I mean, absolutely trounce to the market and it's not even close this year right and uh thank you for a lot of the hard decisions i made in 2022 and um a lot of buys i made right and so 2024 will if i prosper in 2024 a lot of it's going to come down to what it was i buying in 2023 right and then in terms of the stocks i'm buying this year it's really the fruits of that those buys will really pay off in 2025 and beyond right and so i just think that's a you know a good thing to kind of keep in mind right meta has been a tremendous stock this year but let's be quite clear, this was a tremendous stock for us because I was buying the stock hand over fist last year in, in, in the sell-off, right? And now I'm sitting on some of the biggest gains in terms of meta that you'll, you'll find out there. I don't know if anybody's sitting on this big of gains. If you're sitting on the bigger gains than that, congrats to you, man. Uh, but $422,000 in meta gains I'm sitting on, right? There's a difference between, you know, kind of buying a stock a little bit and buying a lot of stock, right? I, I stay with my conviction on that one, right? Palantir, I've definitely you know reaped the benefits of Palantir, and shout out to any Palantir shareholders watching this video right now. Um, you've definitely reaped the benefits of this if you were buying the stock in 2022. It was a very hard period for this company in 2022, and for the stock price. And I mean, if you were buying the stock last year, I mean, you're looking very, very pretty now, right? Amazon, same as that situation. I was buying the stock heavily in 2022, and in 2023, as the stock was just, you know, in a let's call it not the best position as far as the stock price. I'm like, this is Amazon we're talking about here, right? 
in terms of next year, it's really going to come down in a lot of these stocks I've been buying heavy this year. And do these stocks, are these the right plays, right? PayPal, I've been buying a lot of PayPal shares nonstop. My goal has been to get to 2,000 shares by the end of the year. I don't think I'm going to quite make it, but I'll get pretty darn close in regards to PayPal, right? And uh, I mean, we'll see, we'll see. Uh, Cheesecake Factory, another stock I've been buying very heavily. It started to actually already pay off this year, believe it or not. Um, we're already up over 10% on the stock in the public count up $3,764. And that doesn't even include any dividend money. So it's already starting to pay off, but we'll see if it pays off bigger, right? A stock like Fubo, it's already started to pay off, but we'll see if it pays off a lot bigger. You know, a stock like Fubo, if that does turn out to be, you know, what I could potentially think it could be, I mean, you know, that, that, those gains are a very, very small amount. Let's just put it that way, right? My hedges, I got several hedges on the market, right? Hedges on Polaris, Tesla, Toll Brothers, Chipotle, um, maybe even a few other stocks out there. Do those pay off? And, and by the way, in regards to those, do I hope I make money in regards to my hedges? And the answer to that is absolutely not. I hope every single hedge I have expires worthless. Every single one. You might say, well, wait, isn't that throwing money away? No. It's no different than saying, Oh man, I pay in every month to health insurance. If you're watching this video, there's a good probability you pay for health insurance every month. If you're watching this video right now, there's a good probability you pay for auto insurance every single month, right? And you don't walk around and say, gosh, man, so mad I didn't get in a car accident this month because dang, I pay, I pay all this money to my car insurance company or, oh man, I'm so mad I didn't have a heart attack this month because I pay in all this money, this health insurance every month. No, of course not. You're like, good, you know, I pay it in just in case. And it's not a waste of money because, you know, never know if I have to use that someday, right? Same exact thing when it comes to hedges. I hope they all expire worthless. I hope I don't have to use it. That's, a, that's the perfect scenario for me because that means I likely probably made 10x that, 5x that, 20x that in terms of gains because I'm so net long in the market all the time, right? So just a little food for thought in regards to that. Okay, so let's get into some of these uh, new potential buys for me in 2024. And once again, in the comments section, leave me what stocks you guys are thinking about buying for 2024, because I love to kind of read through and see what stocks you guys are excited about to buy in 2024. What, once again, this isn't just what stocks I think will go up in 2024, it's what stocks you plan on buying throughout 2024 that you're excited about, okay? So first one that's a potential Q1 buy, and remember these can change around as the year goes along, if certain stocks go up big or down big or things like that, right? Um, but Q1 is a potential buy, it's actually NVIDIA, right? Now, I know NVIDIA, it looks so high, right? It's $492. Um, it's had a tremendous year. And people are like, oh, the stock's overvalued. It's, it's a ripoff. It's crazy to buy it now. I mean, this is just no way, no way. It's not the right way of understanding investing, right? I mean, pretty much every single time I ever look at a real estate property in any great city, I could say it looks like a bad time because the price is almost always higher year after year after year after year after year after year, decade after decade after decade, right? And all along, it was a great time to be a buyer of real estate. I mean, gosh, you know, look at a property in Los Angeles in the past you know, 50, 60, 70 years, every single decade, you could have said, this is a horrible time to buy. It's so expensive now. And uh, yeah, it just gets more expensive over time, right? NVIDIA is a great example of just a great piece of real estate. I mean, this is a company that it's up 1,376% in the past five years. It's done tremendous, right? And like I said, a lot of people look at this stock and they say, 1,376% in the past five years, it has to go down huge. It's way overvalued, right? Well, what if I pulled this up for you? This stock's up all time. 124,393%, okay? So these gains you've gotten over the past five years are actually very small potatoes compared to the gains you've gotten all time in regards to the stock, right? And uh, great companies perform tremendous over 5, 10, 15, 20-year time frames, right? I mean, you know, companies that are A-plus companies, they put together gains that you never thought possible, and you're like, wow, this stock's really trading at this price, this price, this price, right? And I mean, you could have said when the stock was up 50,000%, oh, that's crazy. Or 10,000%, that's crazy. It can't go any higher. It, it has nothing to do with it. It's all about the business model and the earnings underneath that business model. And when we look at that, we start to find some intriguing things. Because here's something you'll find with NVIDIA that you won't be able to find in probably any other public company in the world, to be honest. Okay, This is a company that's trading at under 25 forward P. Under 25 forward P. And yet the revenue is expected to go up over 50% next year. Over 50%. So this is a very, very, very compelling stock. When I can find a stock that's trading at a Ford P under 25 and a growth rate of 50% plus expected for next year, oh, 
I like that because you're not going to really find that anywhere. Now, if we look at NVIDIA over time, right, I call this a sleep well at night beast company because every single time you ever think NVIDIA's best growth days are behind it or the bear case comes out, Jensen and the team, they find the next angle of growth and the next angle of growth. And, uh, you know, I would almost guarantee you NVIDIA is working on the next angle of growth right now. And we're going to see it in three years from now, five years from now, seven years from now. And then we'll understand it like, wow, they found it again, right? But that's all this company's done over time. And so it'll go some, through some unbelievable major growth periods and then a big kind of downward move. And then a big growth area and then a downward move. Big growth area, downward move. And then it'll go on a next multi-year massive growth trajectory. And then all of a sudden, you know, the company will slow down and, and you know, everybody will claim it's doomed and it's all done and stock will be a huge buying opportunity again. But that's, that's NVIDIA stock over the years. That's the story of NVIDIA, right? Now, the great thing for NVIDIA is they actually only have one major competitive threat in my personal opinion, they're AMD, and that's it. And the, the great thing for them in regards to AMD is they're all, AMD's pretty much always behind NVIDIA. NVIDIA's always usually one, you know, from what I've seen throughout the last decade, is NVIDIA's usually one to three years in front of AMD on almost everything. Um, it, it's pretty impressive, actually, right? And AMD's a very impressive company with what Lisa Sue's put together there, but nonetheless, they're always behind NVIDIA, and they're behind in AI as well, which is why a, you know, AMD, look at their AI-related revenues this year. Look at NVIDIA. It's a whole different ballpark, right? And the other great thing is, at the end of the day, like, there's plenty of growth for both these companies. Uh, people think it's a one, you know, one company gets it all, and that's one-sum game. No. AMD can prosper. NVIDIA can prosper. Look at the last decade. Look at AMD stock price the last 10 years. Look at NVIDIA stock price the last 10 years. Look at AMD's net income the past 10 years. Look at NVIDIA's net income the past 10 years. Revenues, everything. Both companies can prosper. There's plenty to go around with how big these massive markets are, right? Now, the other thing with NVIDIA is they're, they're starting to stack cash. Like, it's nobody's business. It's already up to over $18 billion in cash, cash equivalents and marketable securities. The money's going to continue to pile up because this company's starting to bring in so much net income, it's ridiculous, right? Now, they have, they're down to about $8.4 billion in long-term debt from $9.7 billion at the beginning of this year. You know, I don't know what their plan is with debt, but... I could see a situation where they pay all their debt off in 2024 and bring that number down to zero. I don't know if they'll do it. They might not. But I could see, like, if you look at how much NVIDIA is going to be raking in quarter after quarter in terms of net income for this company throughout the year, they could, this is like pennies for them. They could pay that off and then be debt-free and literally be just a debt-free company, just stacking cash, debt-free, almost like Apple way back in the day, back in the Steve Jobs days when they were stacking cash before they started to issue all the debt and things like that, right? That's incredible. Now, here's the other great thing, right? They got this H200 that's coming out, and this is going to be uh, the next big chip for NVIDIA, and these are going to be sold probably for $40,000 to $50,000 per chip. That's per chip, okay, per H200. The h 100s have supposedly been selling between $25,000 and $40,000 for the company, right? So the great news for them in regards to this new chip is I almost look at it like, you know, every year Apple comes out with a new iPhone and, you know, a certain amount of people go buy the newest iPhone every single year, right? And if you're a company, you're a big dog company, you've got to keep getting the new NVIDIA chips, you know, if they come out with one every year, every other year, you've got to kind of keep, it's keeping up with the Joneses, right? And this happens in the corporate world. Like if, if, one company doesn't want the, the highest tech chips, they're going to fall behind the other company, right? And even if they don't fall behind, there's at least a perceived fall behind, right? Because every the H200 is much more powerful than the H100. And guess what? The H300 is going to be much more powerful than the H200. So NVIDIA kind of gets these customers kind of locked in where they, got, they, they honestly have to keep upgrading and upgrading and upgrading and upgrading. And they're going to fall behind. And once again, whether that's real or perceived, it is what it is. So if you're a big dog company, you're going to have to buy all the H200s you can get your hands on. And then you're going to have to buy all the H300s you can get your hands on, right? And just keeps going and going and going. So that's the beautiful thing with NVIDIA's business model overall. And so I look at NVIDIA and I really, really like what I see with this company. And so at the end of the day, you know, this could easily be a stock I start buying in the first quarter of the year. We'll see what happens. But um yeah, man, uh, pretty exciting one in, in regards to NVIDIA. And I know all the growth, you know, but in terms of the stock price, at the end of the day, it could be very well that NVIDIA is a far cheaper stock today than it was a year ago or two years ago. You might say, well, how's that possible? 
Look at NVIDIA's growth rates a year ago. Look at NVIDIA growth rates now. Look at NVIDIA growth rates expected for next year versus what they were at this time last year. Night and day difference, okay? All right, next stock up here is Netflix, okay? So Netflix, I call this company, by the way, it's actually had a pretty bad past five years. 67% gain for Netflix in the past five years, very bad performance for Netflix stock. This has usually been one of those stocks you can you know, expect to epically outperform the market year after year. And so 67% kind of sleepy for this company. But I call Netflix a company competing against everyone and competing against no one. And you might say, well, what do I mean by that? It's a company competing against everyone, but also no one. So if I just look at the public count, I have several stocks that compete against Netflix because anything that takes attention and time away from Netflix is technically a competitive threat, right? So for instance, Fubo is a competitive threat, right? Fubo TV is a streaming company. Amazon's technically a competitive threat with their Amazon Prime offering. Meta's technically a competitive threat because of Facebook and Instagram taking time away from, you know, time that could be spent on Netflix, right? YouTube's a competitive threat to Netflix. TikTok's a competitive threat. But at the end of the day, you really break it down. You're like, are they anybody really competing with these guys? And I don't really think so. There's really no one that can compete. When you talk about the extensive library this company has of films, documentaries, TV shows, and all their originals nowadays, it's not like they're just trying to bid for whatever the past shows are or the past movies or whatever. Now they're creating their own originals nowadays, right? And the, the great thing for Netflix is everyone can afford it. Everybody, almost everybody's got a smartphone. And so they can download Netflix right there and pay for it right there. And it, basically it's priced for everybody can afford it. It doesn't matter how much money you have or you don't have. You don't have to be rich to afford Netflix or middle class. You could be, you know, even people that, that aren't doing so well financially have Netflix. And because the price points are so low, right? And then they're only, they're about to go into their second year of ads with Netflix, right? which is a tremendous opportunity from, you know, the ad supported tier, which is like, if I recall, six ninety nine, right? But then also sponsorships for other big shows and movies and things like that. Branding opportunities. I mean, this is massive. I mean, this opportunity is in the billions of dollars in terms of what Netflix can do. And the way I look at all these ads, it's going to help offset, in my opinion, Netflix cost of original programming, which I think is going to be very substantial, right? Now, on top of that, when it comes to Netflix, you know, good balance sheet on this company, not as clean as somebody like an NVIDIA, right? But still a good balance sheet, $7.3 billion in cash to cash equivalents on the balance sheet, about 13, a little over $13 billion in long-term debt on the balance sheet for this company. You look at this company, they're expected to spend $17 billion in 2024 on content. The number is mind-blowing, right? $17 billion. You know, I say, that's bad. That's a problem with Netflix. They got to spend so much on their business model. I don't actually look at this as a bad thing like a lot of people look at it as a bad thing. And the reason being is, is you know, come with me on this thought process, okay? You know, think about a company like Nike. They spend, you know, it looks like in 2022, they spent $1.5 billion on endorsement contracts, right? 1.5 billion last year, right? And you say, man, that's such a high number. That's so bad. It's a bad thing with, you know, Nike's business model. At the end of the day, it's helped them grow tremendously over the years by leveraging all those endorsements, right? Growing from 2010, $19 billion of revenue to last, you know, in the, in the past year or so, $51 billion plus in revenue, right? Tremendous growth for the company. If you look at somebody like a Netflix, it's grown from $2.1 billion to $31 billion. And why is that? Because they're always willing to spend aggressively on content, Right. So it keeps their current customers happy and it attracts more and more new customers. And if you see Netflix subscriber numbers, pretty much year in and year out, up, 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 right? They keep their old customers and they attract new ones year in and year out because they spend so much on, on content. And you just, how can you compete with that? You can't, you can't, you don't have the sort of money or the infrastructure to spend to compete with Netflix, right? Now, if I look at Netflix, right? Expected to do $33 billion plus in revenues in 2023, right? Expected in 2025, $42 billion in revenues. These numbers are huge. This company's starting to put up, right? And we're talking about a company that's trading, let's call it, based upon next year's analyst estimates, they're trading about 30 times next year's numbers, right? Here's a deal. I don't think that's expensive. I don't think it's expensive, guys. We're talking about a business model that's pretty much recession-proof, first off, right? 
A business model that's got pricing power, they can easily go up on their customers one, two dollars whenever they want. That's there's no problem for them, right? And you add up how many subscribers they got, that's a lot of money. Pricing power for days. Uh, growth rates, in terms of growth rates, like you're getting a company that's expected to grow double digits, right? So that makes it not that expensive. And you can't compete with them. No one can compete with them. Amazon Prime can't compete with them because for Amazon, they got to spend on so many different things that they can't really compete directly uh, with a Netflix like the way they'd want to really compete with a Netflix. So Apple TV, they're not, they're not competing with these guys, right? That's just, in terms of Apple, that's like the 10th most important thing. Google, now Google's got YouTube, and YouTube's great for, you know, this type of video, long-form content from, you know, random creators and things like that, but you're not putting together an award-winning film on here, right? And so Netflix is just a beautiful business model. And so I look at it and I say, it's actually uh, it's actually buy, right? And so don't be surprised if you start to see me add this to uh, the public account or the Patreon portfolio at some point in time here, right? We'll see, we'll see. Nike, Nike's next one up here. I'm really excited about Nike. So I have a little starter position in Nike, but it's like, let's call it meaningless position right now. I want to build it to be a very meaningful position by this time next year. Now, I would love to buy this stock heavy. And it's another sleep well at night type stock. I'm not going to have to stress about this stock. It's, you know, the performance hasn't been very good over the past five years. 40% for Nike is pretty bad. And right now they're in a downgrade cycle from Wall Street, right? Wall Street was not happy with the short-term numbers in regards to Nike, their short-term guidance. So you see all these guys here today. Jeffries lowered their price target to 110 from 120. Uh, the, these guys, they lowered the price target from 142 uh, or, or to 142 from 127. Wow, they, wait, they increased their price target? That's rare. <laughs> almost everybody on Wall Street, I, I automatically assume that one was down too because literally almost everybody on Wall Street has gotten very bearish on Netflix. And almost every... No wonder I never re you know, remember hearing about these guys. Fubo? What is this, Fubo? Fubo Securities? Um, here's the deal, okay? Nike's sales outlook was very disappointing. 1% growth. That's, you know, horrible, right, for Nike. And so that's what got everybody very pessimistic on the stock. Could be sandbagging. That's something to keep in mind. But what was impactful to me is they've got a cost-cutting plan to go in that's going to save $2 billion, up to $2 billion roughly. So let's just call it $1 to $2 billion. For a business model like Nike, that's substantial. One to two billion dollars in savings, that's huge, huge for this company, right? Now keep in mind, the last 18 months has been brutal in terms of consumer sentiment. If you look at the United States, Michigan consumer sentiment, the last 18 months has been about the most brutal we've ever seen in history, including the worst numbers we've ever seen in history in 2022. Now, Nike sells to the masses. So if people are being sliced and diced by inflation and they're feeling horrible, they're not going to go out there and buy as many Nikes. They're not going to go out there and buy the new pair of Jordans. They're not going to go out. Just either they can't do it or they don't want to do it, right? And honestly, for most folks over the past, you know, that are, you know, a lot of Nike's customer base is middle class or even below middle class. You know, a lot of folks just haven't been able to be in the financial position because it got sliced and diced by inflation so bad, right? Inflation is no longer an issue for at least 2024, which is going to mean consumer sentiment numbers could likely improve dramatically in 2024, and with that will likely improve Nike's revenues in a substantial way, as well as pricing power as well, right? Now, when it comes to Nike, I think, so Nike's fiscal year ends in a weird time, by the way. It ends in May of each year. So based upon, we got to look at the May 2025 numbers, really. really. You know, it's had them at 25 times, you know, forward P right now. I think Nike's actually trading at about 15 to 20. And the reason being is I don't think analysts have properly priced in the one to two billion dollars of cost savings plus a consumer sentiment that let's say gets substantially better over this next 12 months than it's been over the last 18 months, right? And so for that reason, I believe Nike's actually trading at about a 15 to 20 times the May 2025 fiscal ending period there, which is actually very cheap for a stock like Nike, right? Very cheap. If I'm paying about 15 times, I think the company could do $5 plus in EPS in 2025. $5 plus, if not closer to $6, right? So there's just a big divergence between what analysts think are going to happen here with Nike over the next year or so and what I think, right? And keep in mind, they're going to, you know, with all the cost savings, they're probably going to take some one-time hits that hits them over the next quarter or two. As a long-term investor, I'm thinking years out with these companies. I don't, I'm not thinking about the next quarter. The next quarter means nothing to me. I'm thinking about where's Nike at three years from now, five years from now, seven years from now, right? And I like what I see in regards to this one, right? Now, what Wall Street heard last week is sell, 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 right? 
you know, they, they got the weak revenue guide. They got the cost cutting in sell, sell, sell. And all I heard was buy, buy, buy. When I heard they're going to cut up to $2 billion in costs from this business, I'm like, this stock is way cheaper than anybody anticipates. And when I understand this is a component everybody's missing, the horrible consumer sentiment, that's what they're all missing. In regards to this whole story, as consumer sentiment improves in 2024, <laughs> you know, watch Nike's business model improve. Then you got the cost cutting measures on top and we could see EPS fly to the moon like no one's anticipating, right? Right. That happened with Meta last year. No one was expecting, other than me, and maybe you know one or two other people, were expecting Meta to have that sort of performance in the bottom line, right? You added on revenue getting better. On top of that, you added on, obviously, the cost-cutting measures Zuckerberg had on. It was perfect, right? So I really, really like Nike, and um, this is definitely a stock I'm looking at, and I'm like, I got to buy, buy, buy this stock, okay? I, I would love to, at this point next year, I would love to have this be a very substantial position for me, very meaningful at this time next year. Next one up here is Ali Baba, 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 horrible past five years, down 55%. I would love to start a position very soon here in Alibaba, okay? The, the bottom line is, in regards to Baba, the past five years, just been a don't touch, don't own Baba. I believe the next five years is going to be a must own Baba. And a uh, very different philosophy. And it was, it was a don't own for so many years, and, you know, I... I threw the stock out probably four or five years ago. And the reason I threw it out is because I, I just realized like this is a stock you can't own. In the environment we were in with the tariffs and the trade wars and everything that was going on, um, the, the setup was so bad. And then you added on Rona after that, which the, the, you know, the shutdowns in, in China and everything like that. It was, it was a don't own. But that's, that's over the past five years. That's not what's going to happen over the next five years. I think the stocks, I wouldn't be surprised if this outperforms the market significantly over the next five years. And I mean significantly. Here's the deal. Stocks trading at about seven times, seven and a half times uh, next year's expected numbers. And I'm looking at a stock that has, you know, let's call it revenue growth of nine to 10% likely next year. Oh, oh my gosh. Okay. China and the US were becoming friends again. It's very obvious to me that the situation is getting better rather than worse. The situation was deteriorating year after year after year for really, it deteriorated for about, I would say about seven to eight years straight. And we've just started to, let's call it, get momentum back in the right direction. And I see what's going on there, understanding kind of the political landscape. Things are, we're going to become better and better friends. I see that because both countries are realizing crap we need each other. U.S. debt is piling up more than ever. We need China bad. China's economy has been very weak because they stayed shut down for so long. They need U.S. bad. And also U.S. has taken a lot of, um, we've been taking a lot of, let's just call it, work that would usually be done in China and moving it to India and other countries. So both sides are, are in a place now that like, crap, man, we really need each other. And when countries need each other, they become friends again. Because the further they get apart, the more it's going to hurt each country. So now they're both starting to wake up and realize, let's get friends again. And that's why Xi came over uh, to the States, spent quite a bit of time here, uh, you know, got friendly with everybody. And it, believe me, like all that stuff doesn't just magically happen. It happens because both countries realize, crap, man, we're kind of screwed without each other. Okay. The U.S. needs China to buy a lot of debt over this next decade. I can tell you that. Okay. Uh, Chinese economy, I think, is going to start a slow comeback in 2024 as well. And um, I think that slow comeback is going to, you know, accelerate as years go along. And I think that's going to bode very well for Alibaba overall. And I think there's also been a lot of learnings that Alibaba has seen from some of these, um, you know, let's call it little faster moving, quick companies that have, you know, kind of expanded the market. And I think Alibaba's been able to look out there. And I think they're going to be able to replicate a lot of what the other Chinese e-commerce players have been doing. And that's going to bode very well for Alibaba. It's kind of like Meta. Meta Meta lets other people innovate, and then they copy that, and then they just grow like crazy, right? You know, Meta copied Snap. Meta copied TikTok. Like, like they're just phenomenal at that. And Alibaba can do the same exact thing, and they got the sort of team to do it. And so I think the next five years is going to be very bright for Alibaba. And so I would love to start a position in this one and kind of build it out there, okay? Appreciate everybody joining me. As always, make sure you get that free workshop, guys. 1,400 people have gotten it so far. Pin comment down there for access. And I'll email it over either tonight or tomorrow or something like that. Okay. Appreciate y'all. Much love as always. And have a great day.